So hey, what's new? I know some of you are probably sitting there right now thinking to yourself, so he shaved his head but kept the cross dash. Yes. Yes, I did. And I'm going to continue to keep it this way. So up yours. Are you ready to talk about Elimination Chamber 2015? What the hell, why not? Because I'm actually looking forward to talking about this show, believe it or not, from a positive standpoint. I had a funny feeling creep over me as I was watching Elimination Chamber on Sunday. It took me a little bit to figure out that I was having fun. That I was enjoying watching a WWE pay-per-view. Holy crap! I almost forgot what that feeling was like. Made me glad I decided to watch the show. Be nice to have that feeling a little more often. But I enjoyed... Elimination Chamber 2015. I really did. Not a lot for me to complain about, even though you know I'll still find things to pitch a fit about. So are you ready for me to talk about this show? Let's go ahead and get started. You know, I was so excited about Elimination Chamber, as I talked about in the preview video, that I actually watched the pre-show the whole hour. I still can't figure out why I did. I just did. So I had a Zack Ryder sighting just to see him job out to Stardust. I don't know why that character's still a thing. I'm surprised that Zack Ryder is, frankly, even still with the company. You realize it's over four years since he got that quasi, almost, but not really push? Over four years now. Man. Incredible. And maybe this, having Stardust here, is a matter of them getting him ready maybe to face Arrow at SummerSlam. Maybe it's just a matter of they felt guilty that his wife was going to be featured much more in this pay-per-view than he was, and they deserved a match. I don't know. And then you have the Miz TV segment with Miz and Daniel Bryan. You know, you get to the end of it, and you've got the Meta Powers coming out and having their way with um, the Miz, and that's all fine and good. But the dynamics between the Miz and Daniel Bryan are always outstanding, and anytime you can put them in any segment, I'm always going to be intrigued by it, and that's probably a big reason why I actually watched the pre-show. Now let's get to the actual main show itself, and I'll start off with the opener, the Tag Team Elimination Chamber title match. I'm sure everybody anticipated that this was going to be the opener. It had to be the opener with two chamber matches. You needed one to kick off the show in terms of the flow and spacing of the show. Uh, my concerns about this heading in were that you're going to have six different tag teams, so 12-plus people in there. That means that it could be a huge schmaz of bodies, and it could really weigh down and slow things down. And there were moments that kind of came across like that to me, but it didn't end up being that bad. Um, this was definitely the better of the two chamber matches. One thing I didn't like about it is, it's especially the same thing with the IC title matches, they didn't do a very good job of utilizing the chamber. It was very sporadic. You know, you have the chamber. The majority of the action, in my opinion, should not occur inside of the actual ring. You should be utilizing the chamber, especially the fact that there's all this steel fencing there. You should be throwing your opponents into it much more, what have you. There are moments of that in this tag title match, and that's part of the reason why I thought this match was much better than the shit fest that was the IC title chamber match. Um, but, you know, here... You did a couple of good things. The Ascension got a little bit of shine here. The primetime players got quite a bit of shine here. You were allowing the, the, the uh, New Day to use a, 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 an advanced version of the Freebird rule. Just let all three of them fucking in. That's fine. You know, you're setting up the table for a potential feud between the primetime players who deserve a little bit of a run and the New Day, and I'm going to be fine with that. Like I said, this was definitely the much better of the two matches. And, you know, the right team won. The right team made it to the final two. I had no other real problems with it. It was still okay to watch. It was a good table setter for the night. When the Divas started making their entrances for their triple threat title match, I decided I was going to go take a leak, and then I was going to take Summer out for a quick potty walk for herself. And I did that, and then by the time I came back in, uh, with Summer, the match was over, and I guess Nikki Bella had won. <laughs> Maybe it took me longer to do those two things than I thought, but, man, it sure seemed like that was pretty quick. And I guess the whole thing at this point now is they really have their mindset on having Nikki Bella surpass AJ Lee and being the longest reigning Divas champion of all time, and if that's the case, oh, God, whatever. Because at this point in time, you want to shake up the Divas division to me, 
Uh, how about putting the belt on somebody other than Nikki Bella? That would be a good way to go because I don't think she's a particularly good Divas champion. Although in that situation, I don't know if anybody could be a good Divas champion. It's just really more of the same, and she's featured so much like the same as everybody else is. So I'm not sorry or regretful that I missed this match because I'm pretty sure I didn't miss anything at all. You know, I'm not always as dumb as I may look. Every once in a while, I pull a gem out of my rectal cavity. And if you've watched this channel in recent weeks, you remember a video I did just a little bit back talking about um, who could actually beat John Cena for the U.S. title, who should, and the name that I came to and kept coming back to was one man, and that was Kevin Owens. Fight, Kevin, fight, fight, Owens, fight. And the reason was is because Cena, as the U.S. champion, will blow through so much of the roster with his open challenge, has already blown through so much of the roster over the past decade, that you just really don't have a lot of credible challengers for him. So somebody like a Kevin Owens that you can start off with with a fresh slate is the type of guy that has a lot of appeal as a potential foil for somebody like a John Cena. And you saw this play out in this champion versus champion non-title match at Elimination Chamber. This match was great. Fucking great. If this match isn't on your top 10 list of WWE matches or even top 5 at the end of the year, might I suggest you reprioritize what you classify as good wrestling because this match was awesome. If the stupid idiots in Corpus Christi, who after this match didn't do shit, but even throughout the night really weren't that vocal, we're going to chant this is awesome about anything. This is the type of stuff that you can go ahead and feel comfortable chanting about it because it deserves it. It took a few minutes for it to get going, but once it got going, it really got going. Now, do I like the fact so much that somebody like Kevin Owens had to do so much shit just to beat a John Cena clean? Eh. But then again, you're also talking about a guy like Owens that the hardcore fans know, but other fans may not be familiar with, going up against a guy that has been the standard bearer, the gold standard, the foundation, the franchise piece for the past decade. Maybe a guy like Owens does need to do all of that to beat a Cena. That way, everybody comes across the way they need to be coming across. And, you know, ultimately, this was tremendous. The WWE did the right thing, and John Cena did the right thing. And the only thing that they could do which was put Kevin Owens over and put him over clean. No bullshit until I'm sure Cena makes an excuse about how he didn't take him seriously or he didn't realize the threat that was staring him in the face, what have you. And to those of you that will sit there and say that Cena doesn't have that type of power, he does what the WWE does, put down the fucking pipe. If you are a top guy in the WWE, you have a tremendous amount of political sway. This is not anything new. This goes back to the days of Bruno. This goes back to the days of Hulk Hogan, most certainly. Uh, Newsflash, it goes back to Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. It goes back to Austin and so on and so forth. And the Breakfast Club and Cena is a part of that Breakfast Club. So at the end of the day, this doesn't happen if Cena doesn't sign off on it. And thankfully, he signed off on it. Hopefully, this is you know an understanding that He's running out of people to work with. He's running out of people to draw money with. And as a result, you got to build some people up if you want to continue to make money. And now that you've done this, the possibilities are numerous. Now, am I a big fan of them just rushing right into another match between these two at Money in the Bank? No. Would I rather they wait maybe until the next NXT special and do something really special, which is have John Cena wrestle one time on NXT in a main event against Kevin Owens? You know, that'd make NXT a real place to go. You get some new eyeballs onto that product. That's what maybe I would do. And then have their big blow-off match perhaps be at SummerSlam. But the point is, is now that you've had Kevin Owens go over, which was the only option you had with how strongly and dominantly you brought him in. You couldn't just sit there and have him win in a wishy-washy fashion. You couldn't just sit there and have John Cena go over because then what's the fucking point? And you delegitimize the Kevin Owens character that you're trying to establish. This guy has major potential for that company, and he could do some big things, especially when he's got the right dance partners, and a guy like John Cena is the right dance partner. And you look at it now. 
You could do so many different things. The next match you have between Owens and Cena, you could have Owens get counted out. You could have Owens get DQ'd. You could have John Cena get counted out. Most appealing of all, you could have John Cena get DQ'd. If we're going to go there, let's go all the way there and really try to make something special happen and really try to make some money, not only short-term but long-term as well, and help out both characters in the process. You've had Kevin Owens you know, get into his mind. You've had Kevin Owens maybe screw up his body with the second match, and then he could say the blow-off match, the third one at SummerSlam, if you make it that far with this, because they're probably going to rush through it like they did with so many other damn things. You can sit there and say, now it's time for Kevin Owens to take his soul, and he's going after that U.S. championship. The possibilities here are numerous, and the great thing about it is it opens up so many other things, and the thing is, at this point in time, the people that are worried about Cena getting it back, yeah, he probably will get it back, which will be a disastrous thing to do, because at some point in time, there has to be somebody that Cena can't beat. This is a, something you could do with a Kevin Owens that you can't even do with a Brock Lesnar because a Brock Lesnar has lost to John Cena before. Cena Extreme Rules 2012. It helps Kevin Owens if he's the guy that Cena can't beat. It helps Cena if he finally has a guy that he can't beat because not only does it work for the dynamics of getting Owens over in a certain way and Cena over in a certain way, it also means it's something that you can come back to down the road. And not just in a way that feels repetitive and feels dull. It's not some bullshit Dolph Ziggler Sheamus or Daniel Bryan Sheamus type of shit. You have real substance. You have real purpose. You have real reason for why you could go back to the well for it in 6, 9, 12 months down the road and really make some money. This match was great. The booking decision makes it. The fact that there was no bullshit. It was just Kevin Owens beat John Cena. You know... I legitimately popped for so many different reasons. God, this was fucking awesome. It absolutely, beyond a question, made my night. And I know it had to make the night of a lot of people there at Corpus Christi because it seemed like they went to bed after this match. And again, John Cena versus Kevin Owens was great on so many different levels. Man, I had a blast watching that fucking match. That's the type of match that I used to look forward to from the WWE and, frankly, professional wrestling as a whole that I honestly just don't get that very much and I don't have it elicit these type of feelings and emotions out of me that often anymore. However, I also know that when something like this comes around, that something is going to happen. Because of the state of the WWE product, and frankly how crappy it is, and people's tendency as wrestling fans to get caught up in the moment and allow their emotions to get the best of them, you were going to have people saying all types of crazy, off-the-wall, stupid shit pertaining to John Cena and Kevin Owens. Uh, usually I would expect that to just come from hardcore wrestling fans, you know, geeking out over the fact that Cena lost to somebody clean, and in this case it was Kevin Owens. But it, it wasn't. People should be geeking out about that. It was a legit surprise in many ways. It was a good, pleasant surprise. I wish we got more of them like this. It's when I see somebody that should know better that clearly doesn't know better. And I'm referencing Tommy D Dreamer. I almost said Dreamer, like the American Dreamer. We'll talk about him in the moment, the two baby. But you've got Tommy Dreamer. As the Elimination Chamber is going on, you know, basically, and I'm paraphrasing here, but talking about how a bad finish or poor card structure can really bring down and ruin a show. And that John Cena versus Kevin Owens should have main evented Elimination Chamber. Now, this is somebody that's been in the business for two freaking decades plus. Somebody from ECW, somebody that had some success at WWE, went to TNA, now does his House of Hardcore shit, where frankly a lot of times his shows can outdraw ROH or TNA and he doesn't have the national television that those companies do. He should know better. But clearly he fucking doesn't. And what's frightening about this is the fact that there are people that will look to somebody like a Tommy Dreamer in all intents and purposes like they should as a guy that should know and does know and has to know. But clearly in this case, he absolutely doesn't fucking know. This is ridiculous and stupid on so many different levels. And I hope none of you have the idiotic idea that this nincompoop in this particular case is anywhere close to being on point. First, the whole notion of card placement. Yes, card placement is something that you know I talk about as much as anybody when it comes to professional wrestling, especially the WWE. 
And it is critical, and it is vital. And oftentimes it is a big indicator of the success or failure of a show is how the card placement and card structure was executed properly or very poorly. But you're looking at John Cena versus Kevin Owens. And because it was a great match, you're saying in hindsight that it had to main event. No. This is not one of these situations like Hogan versus Rock at WrestleMania 18 where you build the event around that match and then you decide to not have it main event. You decide you got to go with God in the fucking main event. Anybody that was anybody should have known that Hogan Rock was going to steal the night heading into WrestleMania 18. That was an example of terrible card placement, card structure. WrestleMania 25, if you really thought, even with the story involved, that Triple H versus Randy Orton deserved a main event over fucking Undertaker versus Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania, then you're an idiot. And what happened? The whole show went downhill after right buried in the middle of the fucking card is this classic between two of the greats in the history of the damn company. And you have to be smart enough to be able to see this shit ahead of time. But in those cases, you're talking about Hogan versus Rock. You're talking about HBK versus Taker. You're talking about legends. You're talking about icons with all this history and all this story going into it. Kevin Owens versus John Cena has 13 days of fucking build up to it. 13 days. And we're going to throw that match into the main event just because it happened to be great after the fact? For all the WWE knew, these guys might not have clicked, it might not have gelled in, it might have been brutally bad. You can't risk putting that in the fucking main event. And if you did, you'd be a damn moron. Number one, this pay-per-view was called Elimination Chamber. So if any match should main event over Kevin Owens versus John Cena, which by the way wasn't even for the fucking US or NXT or both titles, it would be an Elimination Chamber match. Now since the world title... Wasn't being defended in an elimination chamber. You go to the world title match, which would involve two guys and Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins who have great chemistry, have had some really good matches, and oh, by the way, have almost three years of story behind their characters and their reason for their issue at this freaking match at the pay-per-view. This is the whole shit that was ridiculous when CM Punk was the mid-card world champion for 434 days. John Cena's had plenty of fucking main events where he's not the champion. And no, I'm not somebody that automatically believes that every time the world belt has to be defended in the main event. I don't think that's always the case. There are certain exceptions and circumstances where you can say it's okay to not main event the title. But damn it all, this was not one of them. It wasn't. If you got to the point where you had the blow off between Cena and Owens at SummerSlam, then maybe you could talk. Maybe. But I'm not main eventing it on Elimination Chamber after 13 days of fit fucking buildup over a match between Ambrose and Rollins that have so many dynamics going for it, not to mention the fact it's for the world title between two guys that have freaking three years of history between them in terms of on-screen characters. And these are the type of people that you're supposed to respect. These are the type of people that you're supposed to know better. You guys should know better. And don't buy into this type of shit that idiots like Tommy Dreamer say. Because usually I wouldn't expect him to say something this stupid, but he was clearly off the mark here. Well, unfortunately, somebody had to immediately follow that classic that was John Cena versus Kevin Owens, and it was Bo Dallas and Neville that got stuck in that unfortunate circumstance and in that spot. And honestly, they did the best that they could. You know, that Corpus Christi crowd sucked to begin with, and they were really going to suck after they lost so much of their life force during that Owens and Cena match. Um, so you can't knock Neville and Dallas. They did the best that they could, and, you know, if that live crowd isn't working with you, it's really hard to have a good match, which is a shame because these guys deserved a little more attention. They were trying to do the best they could in a bad situation for them. Sometimes bad is just bad, and sometimes bad can be so bad that it crosses over to being entertaining. I think we all know this. There's a certain element of liking the train wreck, if you will. You can look on YouTube. Some of the most watched videos are the train wreck, so to speak. They're just really bad, stupid, dumb crap. Now, when it comes to really bad, stupid, dumb crap, this Intercontinental Championship Elimination Chamber match can most certainly fit this bill. <laughs> this was brutal. This was bad.
bad on so many different levels, and I'll talk about that now. Now, first, I geeked out a little bit, obviously, as you would know, when Rusev's replacement was announced, and it was Mark Henry. You'll notice when he got into the chamber, he looked up, and some of you might foolishly think he was looking up at the, the steel cage and everything else. No, he was looking for some cheeseburger guidance up above. You damn right. Now, we get to the actual match. Our truth it's wait there. It's <laughs> oh, what else was bad? Now, like in the tag title match, I didn't really talk about the fact that one of the things that sometimes I don't really like about the Lucha style of wrestling is that things can come across very choreographed and very planned out. And while we know it's scripted, we don't always like to be reminded that it's that scripted. And you saw the different spots with like Callisto where... You know, the, you got like six guys just waiting for him, and it, it just looks like shit. And then even the same thing with El Torito. It doesn't look as bad, but you got a sentence in there like, oh, what's this guy going to do? Do, do, do? You know, now you get here to the IC title match, and the crowd is so silent because they really don't care. And this match is so bad that you can hear guys calling out spots all throughout the match. <laughs> it's not every day that a crowd is that silent where you can hear that many spots called out. It was just... Fucking ridiculous. <laughs> and then what else was ridiculous? You knew where this was really heading when the whole deal was Seamus's pod door not opening, and then he finally uses his freaking Celtic cross to open it. I'm like, he can't bro kick the fucking thing open. He can't, you know, shoulder block it open. Somebody can't throw somebody else into it to open it. It just, it just makes no fucking sense. You've got Mark Henry pulling people off of other people in an elimination match, which makes absolutely no fucking sense. Just so much of this didn't make any fucking sense. And part of the issue with this was you really didn't have any major issues between the competitors heading into this. You might argue like Sheamus and Ziggler, but eh. You know, you've already transitioned now into Ziggler and Rusev. Just so many dynamics of this were really fucked up. They really, really were. But the only saving grace for this match, frankly, was that Ryback won the Intercontinental Championship. The big guy gets a singles title. Well, hot damn, color me excited. I don't give a fuck. I'm not going to apologize for being a Ryback fan now. I think he's earned it. I think he deserves it. And he's a guy that they can do something with. So I'm fine with him being the IC champion. And your boy Daniel Bryan is too, so suck it up, fat boys! Oh, and by the way, if you don't like Mark Henry, fuck you! Now granted, as I referenced earlier in this review, after Cena versus Owens, the Corpus Christi crowd really sat on their hands most of the rest of the night. Not a good crowd to begin with. I don't remember them ever really being a good crowd ever, whenever I've seen a show happen there. Um, so why do we have a pay-per-view like this there? God only freaking knows. But you get to the WWE World Heavyweight Championship match. While the crowd wasn't that into it, uh, I enjoyed the match. I thought the match was pretty good. You know, was it an epic classic? Most certainly not. Are there some parts about it that could have been better? Perhaps. Like one thing I would challenge Dean Ambrose to do is to stop being stuck in that video game, you know, the SmackDown video game mode, let's say, of 15 years ago, where you're hitting the same button repeatedly, not trying to hit a body slam to eventually get your guy to be able to pin because you didn't bother to learn how to do the guy's fucking finisher. You know, all this different shit he always does with that clothesline spot. You only do that so many times where it starts to lose its luster and its appeal, and it starts to become a little lame. You've been doing it long enough. You've got to have a little bit more in your repertoire, you would think, than that. I'm just saying. Um, but like I said, in general, these guys have good chemistry in the ring. The story is really good. These are the. This is the rare example of you could throw these guys at each other a lot, and I tend to not get bored with it because of so many of the different layers and dynamics that come together. But then we get to the finish. <clears throat> and you know, there was a fleeting moment where I almost bought into it. I almost thought that Ambrose was the new WWE World Heavyweight Champion. And with what happened on last week's Raw with that horrible 2.54 rating, you know, I was like, there could be a chance that they would actually have Ambrose become the champion at least for the night and try and pop the Raw rating for the next Monday, even though that previous Raw was on Memorial Day, and that's always been a bit of a soft uh, ratings day for them. Um as it went, it's just like, no, this doesn't feel right. The finish was kind of rushed for it to be Ambrose winning the champion. 
something's off here. They're going to do something. And that's what they did, babies. And I tell you what, the American Dream book this beautifully. It's like we down in Charlotte or Greensboro for Jim Crocker promotions. It was a dusty finish of a highest order. Dean Ambrose win the match, but Seth Rollins still the champion. I know this frustrated a lot of people, and this angered a lot of people. But fuck it, it worked. It lets you know that Ambrose can beat Rollins. It lets you know that if given another opportunity, Ambrose probably should beat Rollins. And yet there is probably going to be a reason to believe that Seth Rollins will still keep the championship. I thought it worked. I thought it worked on many different levels. You know, you're even incorporating after the match is over. Since Reigns got banned by Triple H from getting involved and being in his corner, he comes out to make the save afterwards. They take off with the title. You know, are they going to stuff it in a fridge like CM Punk did? Who freaking knows? You know, but you're also playing up the fact that Reigns and Ambrose are friends. And that's one of those storylines that's really missing in today's WWE. Having people actually be friends. Because when they are no longer friends, it makes for a great reason uh, to have an issue between the two of them. It makes for a great program, a great feud. And whenever Reigns and Ambrose do eventually split, this is something you've been waiting for for a long time. It could make for a really, really interesting, compelling feud, especially with the necessary heel turn for Roman Reigns. I'm glad they didn't do the heel turn here. I didn't think the timing in the moment was absolutely right. I'm, I'm glad they did what they did. There were a lot of things they could have done. And look, I don't like the fact that they don't book Seth Rollins as a very serious champion. I don't like that they book him in this kind of chicken shit, cowardly manner. You know, just because that's the way shit used to be done in the past doesn't mean it's the way it needs to be done now. They have a serious credibility issue when it comes to Seth Rollins as a world champion. It's hard to take the guy seriously when he's hiding behind Kane, J&J security, and all this other bullshit. But the finish itself was fine to me. I already had the thrill of Kevin Owens beating John Cena clean in the middle of the ring. You know, frankly, for a lot of you... If Ambrose actually would have beat Rollins for the freaking title, you would have splooged all over your freaking laptops and not been able to stream Money in the Bank in two weeks, let's be perfectly honest. It was fine. I don't have a problem with it. Just don't break out the dusty finish too much. It's funny that we all know it as the dusty finish, baby, because it still was a dusty finish and it was executed perfectly. Perfectly. And it most certainly was. Live in living color. Like the American Dream. But you all know the American Dream still want to get his hands on Tully Blanchard and that world's television championship. Um, but again, I like the finish of the match. I like the show. I had fun watching it. Was it a great epic classic? No, not really. Because neither one of the Elimination Chamber matches were all that particularly great, honestly. I mean, the tag team one was much better than the IC title match. That match just fucking sucked. That was bad, period. I didn't even watch the Divas Triple Threat, but like I said, it was so short, I didn't even notice it. You know, Dallas and Neville were in a spot where nobody was really going to succeed. Um, but you had what happened with John Cena versus Kevin Owens, and then, you know, the dusty finished at the end, baby. I had fun. I just enjoyed watching the show. That's the best way I could put it. It's the best way I could put it. And I wish I had that feeling more often when watching a WWE pay-per-view. It was nice to have it for one night, though.